So we'll continue our study of Aristotle now uh, by looking at those last two uh, powers or sets of powers that we talked about last time. On the one hand, the sensory, appetitive, and locomotive together as the capacities that are definitive of the animal soul, and then thinking as that distinctive thing uh, about human beings, the thing that marks us out from other natural beings. So I want to begin by talking about the animal. Uh, Aristotle uh, himself mostly focuses on the sensitive power. and In some ways that almost seems like what this book is about in his mind. Um, but I want to remain guided by the idea of the those three powers as animal powers uh, and, and use what he does say about sensation to think a little more broadly about the animal as such rather than just focusing narrowly on sensation. And I want to begin, and in fact I use the word sensation um, but as I said last time, uh, sometimes it might, it might seem better to translate it as perception. Uh, the reason for that is that we, j just as there's a kind of early modern conception of nature that is very different from Aristotle's, uh, there's also an early modern conception of sensation, I think, that is very different from Aristotle's. And most of us going to university now in the early 21st century probably bring with us a lot of preconceptions about what sensation is that come from having grown up with actually with people talking about early modern science um, you know uh, people studying optics and whatever and uh, we have some idea about what what must be going on in sensation uh, and Aristotle doesn't have those same preconceptions and he's able to notice some things about sensation that um, we might often miss Oh, so that's why sometimes it's better to use the word perception just to not get wrapped up in all the assumptions we have as soon as the word sensation comes up. But nonetheless, I want you to think about the, what you normally think of as sensation uh, in, in the sense of um, what we normally call the five senses, hearing, sight, taste, touch, smell. Right? So, um, you know, sensation is that, in, in that sense, you know, trying to forget our theories about what it is, just thinking about it as a thing you experience, you know, it's that immediate way, and I, I want to stress the word immediate, it's that direct way, the, the way that like right away you just open your eyes or you can't even control whether you open your ears, you're just hearing something or you're just seeing something. It's that way that right away you're confronted with what's outside you. And you're confronted with what's outside you in, in such a way that it is shaping the form your experience takes. Right? That's what it means to say you're confronted with something outside, right? It is informing you. Um, and so especially in uh, book 2 chapter 12, Aristotle talks about that, that um, he tries to be precise about that process for lack of a better word. Uh, also in book 2 chapter 5, those are the two big chapters where he tries to say just what sensation is. And I want to talk a little bit about Book 2, Chapter 12. But first I just want you to just put in your own mind, I want you to think about just that, the experience of sensing, the experience of hearing, the experience of seeing. Um, in fact, I, I guess I really, this is where the word perceiving comes in. I want you to think about the word seeing or hearing rather than sensing. Like think about what it is to see, what it is to hear. And I'll, I want to read you one thing he says where he kind of he tries to define that basic uh, that basic kind of experience so this is from the beginning of uh, book 2 chapter 12 he says by a sense is meant what has the power of receiving into itself the sensible forms of things without the matter um, that's, uh, this again this translation always over translates a bit and adds a few extra words but that's good enough for us uh, and then he says a little bit later the sense is affected by what is colored or flavored or sounding, but it is indifferent what in each case the substance is. What alone matters is what quality it has, that is, in what ratio its constituents are combined. Well, that's actually a pretty extreme over translation. Uh, he says, he, he says the, the sense is affected by these things, but not in, the, um, in respect of which each of those is said, but in respect of which each of those is said to be of such a sort, and according to Logos. Um, I guess the, the, uh, you don't have to worry about the details of the sentence, um, but the point is the distinction he makes is the, between the way each of them is said 
on the one hand and on the other hand the way each of them is said to be of such and such a sort. So that's what our translator has said. It doesn't get the substance of things, but it gets the quality. Um, I think that point is basically right, uh, but I just want you to know that that's, um, you're not reading quite what Aristotle actually said when you get that from the translator. But anyway, let's just, let, let's just take that idea and think about the experience of, of sensing. And now, this is the important point I want to make. Try not to think about your sensing, but try to imagine the tiger's sensing when it goes for that gazelle, you know, the example I was giving before. The reason I say that is, you know, you can remember that nutrition sort of is definitive of plants. Nutrition also happens in animals, but it's not definitive of animals. It's already subordinated to a fundamentally different kind of life process, the animal process, which is locomotive, sensory, and appetitive. Well, we also said about the human being that we have this thinking power. And so, yeah, we, we uh, have nutrition, but like the animal, that's not what we're defined by. It's sort of uh, integrated into a life process that quite exceeds the terms of nutrition, right? as, as in any animal. But that's also true of sensation, appetite, and locomotion, right? Those things that are definitive of animal reality characterize us as well. But in us, those things don't define what we are. Um, be because we we really locate ourselves in this other identity, in this ability to engage in the world understandingly. Uh, and so, yes, we sense, like the, uh, it, analogously to the way a tiger senses, but the reason I say analogously is, is that that process in us is already the sensing of a thinking being, and not the sensing just of a sensing being. So for us, our sensing is always, in a way, integrated with this uh, more profound function of understanding. So the reason I say I want you to try to think about sensing in the, in the tiger rather than in us is because I want you to try to think about sensing on its own terms, not already plugging into it what happens when you understand. And that should remind you of the point I was trying to make when we were talking about the divided line. Uh, when I was trying to talk about these two different sources that are going in to uh, seeing a, a, a round plate or something like that. Right? Uh, anyway, I won't, I won't dwell on that again. I'll just remind you of that. But let's, let's carry on with just thinking about sensing now in the tiger. Um, and actually, uh, I'm going to put that on hold because I want to go read another passage and, uh, and then take the point from that and bring it back to the story of the tiger. So I want to jump ahead to book three, chapter two. Uh, to my mind, those three chapters, book two, chapter five, book two, chapter 12, and book three, chapter two, are the crucial ones to read to understand Aristotle talking about sensation. He talks about it in many other chapters too, but those three, it seems to me, give you the essential pieces of a basic story. I'm not going to talk about the stuff in book two, chapter five, although I have actually already alluded to it in a couple of things I said, but I really wanted that passage from book two, chapter 12, and then I want to read you this opening part of book three, chapter two. He says, since it is through sense that we are aware that we are seeing or hearing, it must either be by sight that we are aware of seeing or by some sense other than sight. Well, I just want you to notice that thing. It's through sense that we are aware that we are seeing. One thing I want you to notice then about seeing or perceiving when I was asking you to think about what that's like is um, it's not exactly something that just happens behind your back. right? In, in the plant, you know, its nutritive processes are going on, but it's not aware of that. Uh, in the plant, um, think, think of a plant that turns toward the sun, right? In the plant, it's, it's, its plant behavior is obviously responsive to changing conditions in its environment, but it's not aware of that, right? When we talk about sensing, we precisely mean something like that, but where we're aware of it. We're aware that we're turned, or we're aware that it's light over there, or something like that. So to sense is to apprehend, you know, the light and color and shape of things but but to apprehend the light and shape of color involves the idea that you know you're apprehending it and so intrinsic to the very notion of perceiving is a kind of an implicit awareness that you are perceiving right and um, uh, so the, the very nature of sense is that it has what we would call an apperceptive dimension or a self-perceptive dimension. So to see is then both to see a color and to recognize your own activity of seeing. 
in sensing the color, the act of sensing is also in a way manifest. Um, anyway, that's just the beginning line of, um, of Book 3, Chapter 2. Now I want to skip to a little bit later part of Book 3, Chapter 2, where a similar issue is going to come up, but it, it raises a pretty important question. This, this is very similar to a question that was raised against a lock by a guy named Molly No, um, who was sort of critical of, of what, things that might seem kind of simplistic in Locke's account of perception. Uh, and he raises various questions, like it, like he's, he says, you know, um, here, you know, I see this book and I pick it up, but how is it that I somehow know that the, in this case, my book is, you know, black with some white and blue on it. How is it that I know that black, white, and blue thing that I see is the same as this, um, sort of, uh, it's not exactly cubicle, but three-dimensional sort of squarish thing that feels sort of smooth here, etc., etc. Like, I have what we would think of as the tactile awareness, and I have a visual awareness, but the amazing thing is I experience what I'm touching and what I'm seeing as the same. And you ask, where does that sameness come from? Well, that's a question that Aristotle raised. He says, uh, uh, this is uh, around uh, 426b whatever this would be, like around 17 or so. He says, therefore, uh, discrimination between white and sweet, right, between a, a visual quality and a, a quality of taste, similar to the one I just pointed to with touch and vision. Therefore, discrimination between white and sweet cannot be affected by two agencies that remain separate. Yeah, because one and the same sensing being has to recognize what I'm sensing is, or sorry, what I'm seeing is what I'm touching, or what I'm seeing is what I'm tasting. Both the qualities discriminated must be present to something that is one and single. Um, so I just wanted to read you that one sentence. Uh, the whole chapter is about an analyzing that and the related thing about self-perception that I talked about, and they're very, almost the same issue. And the basic point he wants to make is, uh, in the sensing organism, there is basically a common power of sensing. Right? It's not that it's not that there is one th one uh, sensing agency that is seeing and a quite different sensing agency that is touching. It's the same sensing being that senses and touches. Think about it at the level of of bodily movement. Right? I raise my hand. I raise my other hand. I move my legs and move my arms, right? You, you, Legs do one set of things, the arms and hands do a different set of things, the mouth does a different set of things. But when I move, or you know, when I, when I see a ball coming at me and I reach my hand up to block it and I duck and so on, um, it's not like the hand moves by itself, it's I, as this body, that raise my power that is articulated into a hand through an arm up to block the ball that's coming at me or I duck or I turn away or whatever right that you know if you think of yourself at the level of movement you recognize you're a moving body you're not a bunch of different pieces that move by themselves it's you as a single moving organism that moves and your movement takes the form of the relevant organ the relevant functional part of your body doing what it needs to do for you when when it's called upon. And if you start with that that no, model of movement as you, it, that notion of movement as your model, then I think you can bring that over to sensing and see something very similar has to be true. That when you sense it's you who senses the colored thing and it's you who tastes the sweet thing, right? And it's precisely because it's one and the same you that uh, you can recognize them to be the same. It's not It's not one person saw this and another person tasted that. If that were the case, there would be nothing together. But it's you as a single be being in whose sensory experience those things stand, so to speak, combined and compared. Um, uh, so so there is a common power of sensing. And, and who, who is the sub sensing subject? Well, the organism, right? It's the tiger who senses. Uh, so, you know, going back to our story of the tiger and the gazelle, then, um, the, t the tiger isn't a, a sort of a machine made up of a whole bunch of disparate parts, one of which unintelligently calculates red, 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 and another one says sweet, 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 you know, and these inputs go somewhere or go nowhere. It's not, it's not like that at all. The 
the tiger is an organism that's meaningfully related to its environment and it's 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 a form of like life like the maple tree was a form of life and what it takes for the tiger form of life to realize itself is um, an ability through its senses through its immediate its, its way of being immediately struck by what's outside it the tiger has to be able to recognize the things it's going to be able to eat uh, and so it it's going to recognize things like things that move it's going to recognize things of a certain shape which is pretty closely correlated with movement it's probably going to recognize certain smells it's going to be able to see certain things let's just stick with smell i mean i don't know that much about tigers but i imagine whereas aristotle talks here about how you with a piece of sugar or something might recognize white and sweet tiger more likely uh has you know gazelle smell and gazelle movement right it's it's a it's guy hmm i smell some food there it is moving right this the tiger's sensory situation integrates uh, a movement it it probably visually perceives and it probably hears a rustling in the grass you know and it smells that thing and those things together it experiences as the same thing that common sensing subject recognizes a single sensible thing in its world and it recognizes that single thing through the diverse modalities of scent, vision, hearing, and whatever else. Um, but, but those aren't a bunch of different things that's happening. Those are the ways the tiger kind of reaches out and grabs the sensible world. Analogously to the way that you, through hands and feet and eyes and shoulders and all these things, carry out whatever it is you have to carry out in movement. So, so the point that I wanted to make there then, based on Book 3, Chapter 2, was this, this notion that, it's Aristotle's, I think, quite profound insight, that our sensory life is, is in that sense, integrated. There is, or said a little bit more exactly, there is a single function or a single activity that it's sensing, but it's carried out through a ma manifold or a multiplicity of different modalities. And related to that, there is a single object that is sensed a single agency experiences a single object it senses through a multiplicity of modalities and that thing is sensed through a multiplicity of modalities but it is sensed as a one and this thing senses as a one just like you move as a one and you you know grab a ball or grab a book as a one even though lots of different things happened in the process by which you as a one thing dealt with that one thing um, but so so the sensory modalities are united but you can see the point I was making there also was that that single sensing subject that is the tiger is also the single desiring subject and the single moving subject right the the sensing and the appetite and the locomotion in the tiger are also all multiple facets of the same organism enacting its identity they're they're not separate things either right so for the tiger it doesn't have that kind of what i'm going to call a theoretical attitude to sensation or to perception that you and i typically do where we can sit back and just look at things and admire them and, and think about them it's not that um, the tiger's seeing is inherently linked with its desire uh, so that it's it's and it therefore when it sees that thing it sees it as food it sees it in terms of the questions it de its desire poses to the world and to see that motion smell that scent and hear those rustling bushes you know to have that sensory experience is to experience the present of that which would satisfy my hunger and that too is not different from the pouncing it's not different from the inauguration of the animal's own the tiger's own motion in space to get that thing right so you as a very self-reflective thinking being can distinguish those things like you can develop a theoretical attitude towards your desires and you can think about what you want and sort of choose about whether you're going to act on it or not you can think about what you're sensing you can think about how you're going to move like you we humans precisely because we're thinking beings can occupy this sort of meta domain of reflecting on ourselves and thinking about ourselves and that 
This is kind of what allows us to then uh, recognize sort of the distinctions in principle between these different facets of our behavior and then to practice separating them and holding them apart. Like, you know, and it, and it doesn't always start that way. Like when you're, I, I've talked sometimes about my four-year-old son, you know, when he says, let me see that, you know, and the idea of let me see that, first of all, is very linked to his desire, but it's also linked to bodily motion. Like when I see that, that's the same as grab it as far as he's concerned. Um, and, you know, lots of, lots of us adults are kind of like that too. Um, and sometimes he'll, you know, recognize there's something there he wants and he just immediately goes for it, right? So he will actually have to learn to uh, hold apart his, his wanting and his perceiving and his motion. And he will be able to do that because he is a human being. But, but the way he or any of us kind of starts out is with those things pretty much functioning as different facets of the same experiential reality. And in that sense, very much like what is presumably pretty much always the case for the tiger or the dog, right? So um, that's basically the end of that point. I hope that was clear enough. What I'm trying to get at is the integrity or the integration, the unitariness of function that is animaling that uh, to understand it, we have to be able to distinguish what it is to sense, what it is to desire and what it is to move. But in the animal, those are not different activities they are different facets of the single reality that is being a tiger and the carrying out of each of them involves the other so the animal senses movingly and desiringly it desires movingly and percept perceptually it moves desiringly and perceptively and so on but they're all versions of the same thing so i hope that's clear enough and now i just want to go back to the the thing i said before from book two chapter 12 right so that was my attempt to bring out the force of book three chapter two which i think is really profound actually um, but so with that thing from book two chapter 12 where he says said um but the sense is affected um not in that respect of which each of them is said but in respect of which each of them is said to be such and such a thing right uh, indifferent to what the substance is what alone matters is the quality it has that's the way he's translated it here um i just want you to think about that that the 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 relevant thing I want to bring out there is just not in respect of uh, how it is said or the, what he's calling the substance there. Again, think about the tiger and not about you for the moment. You know, the tiger uh, doesn't really know what a gazelle is in the way, as I said before, that a zoologist does. Um, the tiger responds to food. Right? And, and so it, it, it is responsive to something outside it, but it's not interested in its what it's interested in that thing only in so far as it relates to the tiger's needs so he recognizes something it recognizes it in terms of the the ways it can appear to its senses so the way it can be recognized as a perceptible thing in the world outside it a perceptible something but what that something is on its own doesn't matter all that matters is that the sensible form is such as to trigger the, to, you know, to speak to, to motivate the tiger's desiring and appetitive, sorry, desiring and locomotive uh, responses, or, or might even say reactions in as much as um, they're, they're pretty uh, instinctive. So I want you to think about that tiger to go back to that sentence from book two, chapter 12, just to try to notice that point that recognizing something and recognizing it through its uh, sensory or its its perceptible form is different from in a kind of objective sense grasping its what and uh, and that's true of us in our sensory life too it's just that f for us we commonly do sense things such that I say oh yeah I see that house over there right in other words I've already got the what wrapped up in how I sense it. But that's not because that's intrinsic to sensation. That's because that's the sensation in a human being. Uh, so I want to go on now and talk about that issue of the perceiving of the what, which is to say the grasping of the intelligible character of it, the, the, the aspect of that thing that is only apprehensible by a being that can understand things on their own terms right that can say what is that uh, 
And, you know, when I see the house over there, of course, well, it was my sentence, when I see the house over there, um, when I recognize a house, it has to be a recognition that's sort of taking place in what I see. So I'm grasping the intelligible character of something of which I have already apprehended the sensible character, right? But, but I, what I want is for you to be able to distinguish between then what we might call the reception of the thing's sensible or perceptible form from the reception of the thing's intelligible form while also recognizing that we're just still talking about the same thing. We're talking about the intelligible form that is um, presented to us in the sensible form, but that is only recognizable by or manifest to the kind of being who beyond sensing can also understand. Anyway, so that's what I want to go on to talk about now is uh, what he's going to call thinking or the power of the mind, noose, which is that power to apprehend the what of things, the ability to apprehend the reality of things on their own terms. And for that, we're going to turn to book three, uh, chapter four, and a little bit chapter five, which is very short, and a few remarks uh, from chapter seven and chapter eight. But it's basically book three, chapter four that I want to focus on now. I said that I thought that Aristotle's account of sensation as the principle of animal life was profound, and the same is true of his analysis of mind or noose or thinking. Uh, I think is incredibly insightful um, and quite provocative. Uh, it was the kind of thing that will that can really um, move you in your philosophical thinking, as can that account of sensation. Um, but so to get into that, uh, which is the so other point I want to talk about today, to get into that, I want to do the same thing I did with sensation, which is that I want you to just try to think about what it, what it is right off the bat. So now I was getting you to think about sensation in the tiger. We can't do that with thinking. Now I want us to think about that distinctive thing we do, uh, thinking. And we have, of course, already done that quite a bit, way back when we talked about Parmenides and Heraclitus and so on, um, and Pythagoras. Uh, and more recently, especially when we talked about the divided line and we were distinguishing the sensible and the intelligible. So, you know, you can try to put that stuff back uh, in your own mind as a, a kind of reminder of how we've already got ourselves into the understanding of what understanding is, thinking about what thinking is. Um, but uh, but let's just take a slightly fresh start. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've used this expression before, you know, apprehending the what of something. Right. Well, the, the what, um, the what it is, is what Aristotle actually says, uh, tatiesti, tatiesti. Um, the what it is of something. That's, uh, he also uses that expression that I mentioned, tatienenai, with the what it was to be. Uh, those expressions, tatiesti and tatienenai, the what it is and the what it was to be, are expressions he uses for the form. Uh, and the, uh, they're often translated by other people as the essence, which is fine. Uh, but I like his expression, the what. I think uh, he doesn't make up some other word. He tells you sort of experientially and sort of linguistically what that thing is we're talking about. It's the what of something. And uh, we do grasp that. that. That is, you know, it's hard to think of four minutes in your life that don't revolve around grappling with some what's. It's like we we are so involved in knowing no, let me just say that word we're so involved in knowing right that doesn't mean automatically that in the modern sense you're going to be a physicist and go out and investigate some particle or something so sometimes we think that's what we mean by knowledge and of course that is a kind of knowledge it's, you know scientific investigation into the world and so on but but knowing is a much more everyday phenomenon knowing is you know knowing that that's a house knowing that this thing over here is a chair, you know, knowing that this is a laptop computer. We rely on grasping what the reality of a thing is in its own right uh, in virtually everything we do. And again, going back to the divided line, you know, one of the points that I was really trying to bring out of that was the importance of distinguishing the contribution of intelligence from the contribution of, um, in the case of the line, the, the visual, right? Uh, so that we, or more broadly, the sensible, the sensible and the intelligible. Well, that's what I want you to think about here again. And the point that I started making already with the tiger, but that I'm really trying to emphasize now, right? The difference between that thing which is knowing 
and that thing which is, let's say, perceiving. I'll translate it that way instead of sensing. Right? That thing which is apprehending a something, you know, that's that's um, uh, that you're able to perceive immediately outside you, and that is integrated with your experiences of desire and motion and so on. I want to distinguish between what I was calling the apprehension of the sensible or the perceptible form from the apprehension of the intelligible form, where that language, apprehension of the intelligible form, I now want to call knowing. And what I mean by that is the recognition of what something is. Right? And so the, so the thing then that I'm trying to bring out is that one of the things that we as human beings are always wrapped up in is knowing. We're knowing stuff left and right. Um, and that is the recognition of, of what's. Um, so I want you just to think about that. I want to say that stuff, you know, it's, re it's sort of repetitive, but I, but I want you just to sink into thinking about how much knowing is what's happening in your experience all the time. It's like the very um, texture, the very framework of your experience as you walk down the street. With that in mind, I want to read you something from Book 3, Chapter 4 of On the Soul. Uh, and it's the beginning of the, what's the third paragraph in our translation? He says, therefore, since everything is a possible object of thought. I won't continue the sentence. I just want you to think about that notion. Everything is a possible object of thought. Well, I mean, that's a thing to recognize about us as knowers or thinkers. Like, you can think about anything. I can't sense what's going on in China right now. I can imagine it and I can think about it. And those two three those two aren't quite the same. You know, imagining is conjuring up um, a kind of a quasi sensation. And by quasi sensation I mean conjuring up what it would be like to be in the immediate presence of that. Right? And I was saying before that sensation or perception is the immediate presentation of something outside you. Well I can I can imagine in the sense of try to generate for myself on the basis of the kinds of sensory experiences I've had in the past uh, a kind of a kind of mock-up of what it, what it might be like to be immediately present to that that would be imagining uh, but I can also think about it and that's different I mean that's that happens presumably when you read the newspaper and people tell you about stuff that's going on in China or when you read a book about China and you can sit down and you can try to figure out like what is what is the basic principle of Chinese culture or, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, you, but you can think about that. You can think about Mars. You can think about space travel. Um, I'm picking these things because I'm, I'm trying to make a point of saying uh, you can really think about, which is to say try to understand the, the nature of various realities that, that are clearly not available to you in a, in an immediate sensory way but so so i can think about anything and, and indeed i can think about anything that shows up on the street too right there, there, thinking is a power that i can deploy wherever i want and it has no limits and so i just want you to notice that pretty striking characteristic uh and which which may not strike you just because you're so familiar with it but if but if you notice it you think well that's pretty weird and that is that infinity which can only run so far, you know, but but thinking goes anywhere and it can go to places that in principle you couldn't even sense, right? But so let's finish that sentence. So he says, therefore, since everything is a possible object of thought, since everything is a possible object of thought, mind, in order, as Anaxagoras says, to de dominate, that is to know, mind, in order to know, must be pure from all admixture. Why is that? Well, if you could think about anything, right, and if thinking means, if knowing means apprehending the nature of that thing, uh, it's got to be the case that you are, the mind then, you as a thinker, are universally open, universally inclusive. And if you're going to be universally inclusive, that means you can't be exclusive of anything. Right? And so that means your mind can't have a character that, of its own that is this as opposed to that. And then he says, uh, for this reason, it cannot reasonably be blended with the body. Because if so, it would acquire some quality, for example, warmth or cold, 
or even have an organ like the sensitive faculty. Right? And the point is that would be in a sense exclusive. So let's just think about that for a second. Right? The, the eye uh, uh, is in, in, a, in a human being is positioned here. And that means you can look that way, but not that way, right? Because it has, because it is a body, this, it has, a, it, it is the seeing is the capacity of a person that's enabled by and through a sensory organ. That organ is a body and it is oriented. It's in a particular place. And, you know, you look out that way, the, the very ability that lets you see forward means it's impossible for you to see what's behind you. Right? So, um, in the eye, the capacity to apprehend the sensible forms of things comes with a kind of bodily determinacy. It is the power of a specific body, just like the power of the hand is the power to grasp. But because it is the power of a specific body, it's a finite body. It may be that it can see anything within its visual field, but it can only see in that field and to have that field, it has to have the rest blocked off, right? Um, you know, I talked about the power to grab. Once again, that's an amazing power. And in a sense, I can grab anything if it's in front of me. But, but I can only grab, you know, in the way that my body is oriented. And I can only grab things of a certain size. Like the power to, the power to grab that comes with this hand is a power to grab things of this size but not things of this size. And, you know, sometimes I find when I'm trying to pick up tiny little things off the floor, I also can't pick up things this size. Right? So that power uh, is a power of the hand, or more exa exactly, of me, insofar as I have this hand, or am this hand. Uh, that power is, is very open, but it's open in that limited way. It's limited by the determinacy of the bodily organ, which, because it is an organ, necessarily excludes. It, it allows you to do this, but not that. Right? Um, and furthermore, the eye can apprehend what is visible, which is going to be colors, shapes, motion. Um, uh, and the hand, because it you know, can touch, is going to get rough and smooth, warm and cold, that kind of stuff, motion again and shape. Uh, but the eye is not going to get hot and cold. And the hand is not going to get uh, blue and red. I, going back to that thing about the common power of sensing in Book 3, Chapter 2, I, as the sensing subject, get all those things and I can compare them and so on. But the hand, uh, the, which is the organ for touch, um, is excluded from color because of its bodily determinacy. And the I, as the organ for seeing, is excluded from uh, hot and cold because of its bodily determinacy. So the thing I'm trying to draw your attention to, which is the thing Aristotle says, is that the, the receptive power of sense is the power of a body. And for that reason, it is inherently finite and exclusionary. And that's why sight is different from touch. Um, but the power of the mind is that, in principle, it can't exclude anything. It, it's It's got to be open. Or, or let me put that a different... Uh, a different way to that same point, right? I was saying before, at the most basic level, as a sensing subject, I'm a body, and that means I can look that way, but I can't look behind me. I can turn around, but then I see that way, and I can't see the other other way, right? The nature of my experience as a body is that I see everything from or in terms of my perspective, and that should remind you actually of what I said about the tiger. That the tiger doesn't really get the what of things. It gets the sense of what it perceives because of the intrinsic needs of its life form. And so it doesn't really see the gazelle on its own terms. It sees food, right? Well, that, you know, that's a, that's a, a version of the same point that I'm making that, you know, just at, a, just at that, at the, at the barest cognitive level, I see things from my perspective, right? But the whole point of knowing something, knowing the what of something is that you're knowing it on its own terms. You're knowing it in a way that is not defined by the perspective of the one trying to know it. So there is knowledge only if one can occupy that essentially perspectiveless position. Uh, and so if it is the case that anything is something that is a possible object of thought, 
then thought cannot have a perspective, right? And that means it can have no determinate character of its own. If it did, then it wouldn't be able to have a perspectiveless orientation on things, and therefore it wouldn't be able to know. It wouldn't be able to be universally open. So that's the point Aristotle is making in that, that, that paragraph I was reading. Um, and so let me read you his conclusion again. I already read it, but for this reason, it cannot reasonably be regarded as blended with a body, because if so, it would acquire some quality, right? And let's take that back to the beginning of, of um, chapter four. He said, uh, this is how the chapter began, turning now to the part of soul with the part of the soul with which the soul knows and thinks, whether this is separable from the others in definition only or spatially as well. So, you know, we talked about matter and form in a natural thing. And we said, well, you know, you can logically separate them, conceptually separate them. Like, you know, you're talking about different aspects of the thing when you talk about the form and the matter. But they're, in reality, inseparable. They can't be really separated because the form is the very form of that matter. That matter doesn't exist if you took the form away. And the matter is the matter of that form. That form doesn't exist if you took the matter away. So they're not, they're, they're in a natural thing. Form and matter are two views of the same thing, which is quite the opposite of what they're like in an artificial thing. Right? But so there we already saw that notion of things that can be separated logically, but not spatially, not in reality. Well, so that's what Aristotle says here. He says, well, when we, when we look at the power of the soul that is thinking, is that something that we will be able to distinguish from sensing and nutrition as a conceptual distinction, but but not a spatial or real distinction, or will it be spatially and really distinct? So, you know, with nutrition and sensation, we can conceptually distinguish those, and we've been doing that. We've been working out what it is to sense, move, and desire versus what it is to be engaged in self-nutrition, growth, and reproduction. Um, but in the animal, though they're conceptually distinct, they're really inseparable, right? The that very sensing subject we were talking about, that is the animal, is also the self-nutrifying subject. It's one and the same thing that is engaged in this process of self-nutrition and growth. Uh, but that, that self-nutrifying growing thing is the very thing that is the, a life form that uh, realizes itself by sensing, desiring, and moving. Well, so now we're asking the same thing about thinking. Thinking, I've just said in a way what's necessary to distinguish thinking from sensing. Namely, it is universally open to things on their own terms. Uh, whereas we've been saying sensing is finitely open to particular species of perceptible form, you know, because of the bodily character of the organs and so on. Uh, so, you know, just I won't repeat all that stuff, but we already were making that distinction. So we have separated the power of thinking in definition or conceptually from the power of sensing. We know they're not the same thing. And again, that was the whole point of the divided line was to draw that distinction. But now the question is, are they separable spatially? That is to say, is the power of thinking a, a, a real existent that is... Uh, the same as the sensing existent and, and self-nutrifying existent, uh, or is it basically a different thing? And, the, and you know, um, again, um, because of the, what you've probably come upon in modern study and philosophy, that's an issue you're familiar with, uh, and it's good. I'm going to refer to the fact that you're familiar with that issue, but you probably have a lot of weird prejudices about it. But that's basically the issue of whether, the, roughly, the mind can be separated from the body. Right. So uh, that's an old issue, but the form in which people tend to think of it in the early 21st century is largely derived, uh, I was going to say from Descartes, but that's actually a half-truth. It's derived from the way Descartes has been talked about. Descartes himself is, you know, way more astute and insightful than the things said about him by the people who talk about him. But, you know, there's a thing people call Cartesian dualism which is the, uh, the real distinction, as Aristotle says, or sorry, as, as Descartes says, a re there is a real distinction between mind and body, meaning a distinction in reality, a separability. But we're familiar with that notion of the Cartesian dualism of a mind that's separate from a body. And, you know, in your philosophy class, people you know, debate about that and so on. I want you to think about that issue, but I want you to try to forget 
uh, all the pre-established roots you have for thinking about what that means and how you're supposed to deal with it. One of the reasons this should be striking is that Aristotle's definition of the soul was the opposite of a dualism, right? His whole point was that soul and body are one, which means, and you may not have thought about this exactly, but you should now, he meant that bodies are intelligent. Right? A natural living body isn't a lump of mechanical pieces moved around by some external force. Right? The body of a living thing is it's kind of intelligence embodied. It's kind of intelligence in action. Right? The, the animal body is the material realization of the power of sensing, moving, and desiring, and so on, the kind of intelligent responsiveness to the environment. The tulip is nothing other than a body that is intelligently responsive to the uh, environment in the air, you know, with the sunlight and so on, and the ground with the minerals and the water in it that um, will provide it with the resources it needs for living and so on. Um, so the, the, the plant body is an activity of behaving. The animal body is an activity of behaving. Behavior is intelligent responsiveness. And there is nothing other than the body doing that. Right? So Aristotle's uh, notion, uh, definition of the soul and so on, what we've been talking about, is this profoundly uh, anti-dualistic model. This, and, but what that means is he construes body as something inherently intelligent and literally alive. And that's really, just going back to a remark I made last time, that's really how this whole thing differs from what you'd get out of reading someone like Newton. Uh, but so you should have been struck by this, you know, remarkably powerful challenge to a kind of dualistic way of thinking that you probably associate with Descartes. But so one of the reasons Book 3, Chapter 4 of On the Soul should be so provocative and, and uh, uh, eye-opening is because here he's saying, as Descartes does, there is a real distinction between mind and body. That nous, that by virtue of which the soul thinks and knows, is distinct not just in logic, but in space or in reality from the body, right? As he said, uh, for this reason it cannot reasonably be regarded as blended with the body, because then it would require, uh, it would acquire some quality and wouldn't be able to do as it, what it does. If you look at the phenomenon of knowing, you have to recognize that that power cannot be a power of a body, the way grasping is a power of a hand or seeing is the power of an eye. There's a little bit more in this chapter. Um, I'm just going to name a couple of the other things here. It, it is, uh, still on this distinction of uh, sensation or perception on the one hand and knowing or thinking on the other hand, um, just to help bring out even more the distinctive character of this activity that we're trying to grasp. And he, and he says here, observation of the sense organs and their employment reveals a distinction between the impassibility of the sensitive and that of the intellective faculty. Impassibility meaning uh, it, it doesn't get damaged or changed, right? So he says, uh, here's how a sense isn't so impassable. After strong stimul stimulation of a sense, we are less able to exercise it than before. So normally, your ability to sense is a power, and in the activity of sensing, you don't lose that power. You enact it, but it's you, you still can retain the same power to, to sense, even through using it. But if you envision sense light, but you have too bright a light, it diminishes your capacity to see right after that. Or if you go to a concert and you know it's really loud, you come out, you can't hear that well. Um, and presumably the same things with touch and taste and smell. There, there are ways, in other words, that you can be kind of blasted with the very thing the sense is designed to apprehend, but you can get it in a way that sort of passes the threshold of what the sense can tolerate, and that very thing it's supposed to receive actually starts to undermine it. Right. Uh, so after strong stimulation of a sense, we're less able to exercise it than before. Uh, but in the case of mind thought about an object that is highly intelligible renders it more and not less able afterwards to think objects that are less intelligible. So in other words, you know, I was saying before with, um, you know, the divided line in Plato, you know, you're going from 
something to its cause, to its cause, to its cause, right? The further you advance up that line, the more you are getting to the real truth of things, right? And and that's that's an exercise in thought, and you are you are getting to things that he's as he's saying that are more intelligible. You're getting to things that uh, uh, more directly hand you the real terms in virtue of which things can be understood. And they're harder to, you have to study. They're harder to get. You have to work to them by working on other things and using whatever powers are available to you to get in the position where you can make that understanding. You know, and, you know think about reading a book. You know, you, you read this thing and you don't initially understand it. You keep reading, you keep trying, but eventually you get it, right? And so you, you go through this process of, through trying, eventually having a kind of insight revealed to you, right? Um, and so, but it's but it can be hard work, and so it's pretty easy to recognize a shadow. But it takes quite a bit of work to get to the point where you can grasp what's being said about the good, for example. But as you do that work at apprehending the the more intelligible things, like the pure, strong, intelligible things, that doesn't make it that doesn't make you a poorer thinker. The way a bright light makes you a poorer seer, or a loud sound makes you a poorer hearer. On the contrary, the more work you do to think the deeply, strongly intelligible things, the more powerful you become to think the less powerful things. So there's another distinction between, experiential distinction, between uh, sensing and uh, thinking. I want to mention a couple other things. Uh, so the the mind is, is this, uh, as he said, you know, the capacity to know, but it has no character of its own. And that means, as he says uh, around... 429b 30 uh, that mind is actually nothing before it thinks right it, because it's it's not a body it's not like a sense organ like there's there's a capacity to know but but it has nothing to it until it's actually known something right but but then he says in relationship to that uh, 429b 5 once the mind has become each set of its possible objects as a man of science has uh its condition is still one of potentiality, but in a different sense. The mind is then able to think itself. Again, the Greek there is a bit tricky. I'm not going to worry about it. All I wanted to bring out there is, you know, you have the power of thinking. And through the power of thinking, you come to grasp things. And that, as I was just saying about grasping the more intelligible things, that in fact enhances your power to think and understand. So actual knowing kind of underlines and enhances the the power you have to know, the power you have to understand, but it's at it's at that point that that your mind is actually something. You have understood something now, right? So you've gone just from sort of having a power to actually knowing, and as he says, uh, as is translated here, the mind too is then able to think itself. Um, like I said, the Greek is a bit tricky there, and so people have interpreted this differently. But but I'm going to interpret it in a in one way that fits with the things we were saying about sense before. Remember, with, we, I began by talking about the common power of sensing and the idea that in sensing th something, uh, you also have to be aware that you're sensing. And a similar point is being made here, that the mind, your mind in knowing something, it also is then, uh, becomes actually something rather than just a, as, an as yet unused potentiality. And at that point, it uh, the possibility of thinking about your own thinking becomes a real thing too or the capacity of knowing yourself um so i just wanted to mention that last little parallel um uh so i wanted to bring those things out about the mind i'm going to make one further point but I, i'm hoping there you know i asked you to begin by thinking about the activity of knowing and so on and thinking about the mind and i tried to do that here and to to use that reflection on the experience of knowing to bring out aristotle's extremely powerful points and along with that to show the force of his conclusion, right? That the mind necessarily must be something separate from the body. Uh, should be the case if you've had any kind of philosophical education, you go, wait, 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 that, that's troubling to me, right? Well, so I wanna just carry on a little bit uh, uh, further with that so you can think about this issue of, as we might say, dualism. I'm just gonna say one thing about ch uh, chapter five, uh, and then I'm gonna come back and try to interpret that sort of thing. And then that's, that's what we're gonna end, end for now. So in, in chapter 5 at uh, 430a, around 14, he says, And in fact, mind as we have described it, what, I've just been, what we've just been doing, 
is what it is by virtue of becoming all things, meaning, you know, we're talking about the, the process of knowing whereby you come to live from an insight into what all these things are, right? Um, that your, your, your mind, so to speak, has become populated with this knowledge. Um, mind, as we have described it, is what it is by virtue of becoming all things. Well, there is another, which is what it is by virtue of making all things. And this is uh, something like light, uh, which is something that makes, as he says, that makes potential colors into actual colors. Um, all he's going to say here is, uh, and then as I said, I'm going to want to interpret the significance of this, but he's saying there we've talked about, so far we've talked about mind as a kind of receptive capacity, the ability to receive the intelligible forms of things. And the same model that um, the senses are able to receive the sensible forms of things, right? Both sense and intellect or sense and knowing are both objective in the sense that they're both about uh, apprehending it, right? Whereas nutrition is about turning something into yourself. But, but um, sense and uh, knowing are about apprehending the character of, of something alien to you, some sort of object, right? Uh, and so in that sense, they're receptive. And so far, that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about the mind in this receptive capacity of apprehending the forms. But he says there's there's something else about mind. There is also the issue of how it is that it uh, insight comes about, coming to understand comes about. And he says that that's mind in another sense, not the mind that becomes all things, but the mind that makes all things, or the mind that brings things to light. So we've been talking about mind in a kind of passive sense, how you receive. But he says there's also mind in a kind of active sense, which is the um, making it come to pass, I guess, that there, that there is this apprehension of intelligibility, right? And I emphasize the word making, making it come to pass that there is this, right? Because he says this is a, a, a thing that makes the maker mind. And he says it's in, in this sense, mind in that sense, the making it come to pass that there is an intelligible relationship to things. Mind in this sense is separable, impassable, and unmixed, right? So he said, you know, he's been making, he's making this claim, mind can't be mixed with body and so on. And he's saying this cannot be. This is the power that makes things um, understandable, un uh, that, that brings it about that there's an intelligible relationship to things. So now I want to just try to interpret that a little bit. The thing Aristotle is saying that is, I think, probably different from the way you most likely think about mind, especially if you studied your people talking about Descartes and so on, uh, is that whereas sensing is essentially one of your powers, mind is not. Right? He already said mind cannot be mixed with a body. If that's right, then mind is not actually of this. And in that sense, it's not exactly of you. And what what that means, what that means is Thinking is more like something that happens in reality. And you have the opportunity of participating in it, though you don't exactly do it. Uh, so this body has the sense organs and you see stuff and so on. You move your own arms and so on. But again, if you think about the experience of understanding, uh, you wait for insight and when it happens it's like a light comes on and you suddenly get something you say oh i got it or you say um with uh with the uh, archimedes eureka right oh, i found it i got it um you know ex ex uh, understanding is characterized by those those eureka moments when we go from a situation of encountering some circumstances that puzzle us in a certain way and we want to know the what but we don't immediately have it. So in that sense, we're apprehending a sensible form with a kind of question, you know, what is this? But as yet, the intelligible form of that has not been manifest to it, to us. But then we have that sort of flash of insight or that eureka moment. And you say, oh, I get it now. You say, that's what it is. But the, the thing I want to emphasize there is that in that experience of coming to understand, we essentially experience ourselves as receiving something. 
there's a kind of passivity to that experience it's not the the understanding is not something we make it's something we hope for it's something we prepare for but when it happens we get it it's given to us and so Aristotle is saying that the th then that the thing about us unlike the tiger isn't that we are minds it's that the amazing thing about human beings is that we have the capacity to participate in the intelligence of reality. We don't make it, but we are open to receiving it. How it happens, it's pretty mysterious. Uh, it's not something you do, but it's something you undergo. And so mind, as Aristotle uses that term, is not a piece of you. Mind is it's almost more like nature, like it's it's something in something about reality and the thing that is true of you is that you have a receptive capacity to mind and that is the sense in which you can think you can receive insight and having received insight you can then use it as something to figure other stuff out with but you can't make it be the case that you understand things you you have to wait for for mind to do its own work and to let you in on the secret, so to speak. So, so the way Aristotle understands mind is much more like uh, a power and aspect of reality that is revealed to us because of the kinds of beings that we are. But it's not, it's not itself one of our powers. We have a certain receptive potential with respect to it. But we don't have the power to think in that active sense of, of uh, making things intelligible. We receive that. Once we have it, we can use it. Um, and with that, I want to turn to one last little bit here. Um, this is in just a couple of lines from chapter 7 and chapter 8. In chapter 8, he says, uh, this is at 432a around 6, he says, Hence, no one can learn or understand anything in the absence of sense and... When the mind is actively aware of anything, it is necessarily aware of it along with an image. And he said in chapter 7, this is at around 431a14, to this thinking soul, images serve as if they were contents of perception. Uh, and that is why the soul never thinks without an image. So those two things, uh, I'm just going to pull together uh, with, this, with an expression, you know, that thought always takes place in a phantasm, in an imagination. And the point I simply want to make there is, uh, Aristotle, uh, and this is just a continuation of that point I was already making, it may well be, it, well, as he says, that mind is a kind of independent reality. Nature is an independent reality. Like, nature is just what, a naturally occurring thing, and he's saying this mind is that too. Um, we are not minds, but we have access to it. But we don't just occupy that position of being the thinking thing. We, we never are that. We are able to receive the thoughts, but we receive them in the terms of the kind of experience we can have, the kind of animal experience we have, which is sensory. Right? So we can, we can come to know the intelligible forms of the world we can sense, uh, and we can even think beyond that to the extent that we can conjure up um, experiential contexts through imagination that could house thoughts. But so we never occupy the realm of thought as such. What we do occupy is our realm of what is sensible and imaginable. Uh, in such a way that the intelligibility of that can be made manifest to us. Um, and so, uh, that, so that's enough. So you can think further about that. I don't want to pursue it further right now. Um, but I want you to think about that idea then, that, that what Aristotle is saying through his analyses, but essentially what he's discovering through his analyses, is that our experience of understanding the what of things reveals a kind of reality that exceeds us, exceeds the rest of nature, is not reducible to it, but that nonetheless 
is manifest to us in our natural existence, and that is the reality of intelligence, the reality of thinking. And that is not exactly something we can do, but it's something we receive and that we can use. We can use the insights once we've received them. And the ability to do that, not the ability to think exactly, though, you know, in casually speaking, we say that, and he says that too, but uh, we don't have the ability to make things intelligible. But we have the ability to think from the intelligibility that has been revealed to us, while nonetheless our reality is always to be bodies, right? We, as bodily sensory beings, have the capacity to apprehend something that is not bodily or sensory, and to apprehend that in a way that informs our inhabitation of the sensory bodily world. That's the distinctive character of the human being. So the human being is not um, exactly something different from animals. Right? Where, but, you know, where the animal occupied a function that made it different from a plant. Human beings aren't quite like that. We're animals, but we are the kind of animal that has the ability to um, be aware of and engage with kind of a non-animal realm, the realm of mind. That notion is the core, then, of how Aristotle really defines the human being, which is to say his observation of the place of the human being in nature reveals that to be our defining character. And we're now going to move directly to his study of human life and its fulfillment in the Nicomachean Ethics. And this thing I've just said is, is going to be what we're going to see reflected in his opening attempt just to characterize what a human being is.